The existence of God is the most discussed and perhaps the most important question in philosophy. For the majority of the world's population, God provides meaning, morality, metaphysics, and hopefully salvation. A rich history of scholarship defending God's existence has meant theism has long been considered a reasonable worldview. However, with the rise of secularism and the new atheist movement, a fiery and passionate debate has ensued, one of science versus religion. Our question is, can the two be reconciled? In this episode, we'll be discussing God's existence with one of contemporary philosophy's most influential thinkers, Professor Richard Swinburne. Best known for his great trilogy of books, The Coherence of Theism, The Existence of God, and Faith and Reason, Professor Swinburne's impact on philosophy of religion has been enormous, from high school classrooms to university halls. Every teacher knows his name, and every student must wrestle with his work. According to Swinburne, Theism is the friend and not the enemy of science, for God explains everything that we observe, from the universe's existence and the scientific laws which operate within it, to its extraordinary miracles and conscious creatures. If we want a complete explanation of the universe, says Swinburne, then science needs God. And welcome to episode 102 of the Pan Psycast. I'm the infinitely simple Jack Symes, and I'm joined once again by the card shuffling maniac that is Mr. Ollie Marley. Hello. And the man made of two parts, Professor Richard Swinburne. Hello. Welcome to the show, Richard. It's a pleasure to have you on. And the first question we ask all of our guests is a nice, easy one to start What is philosophy? Philosophy is the study of the deepest questions there are, of what is the explanation of there being a universe, what is the explanation of it having the laws of nature that it has, and having the uh, human beings and other conscious beings within it. It asks the question of what are the fundamental moral principles, how ought we to behave, and in effect, all as it were the necessary truths of any universe and all the contingent truths of our universe, it asks for the deepest explanation. Of course, science explains one phenomenon, the existence of the physical universe at a certain time in terms of its existing at an earlier time, in terms of the operation of laws of nature and how things were at that earlier time. And those explanations are correct. But you need to explain further why there are laws of nature and why there are those laws of nature and why there was a universe at all. So I assume then, Richard, you don't have much sympathy for Daniel Dennett's view. He told us when we spoke to him the purpose of philosophy was to sort the questions out before passing them on to science. Well, it depends what you mean by sort the questions out. But if it means look for the most general principles to which uh, science must conform, then I certainly should have mentioned those principles. That is to say, science has certain principles about what is evidence for what, not just science, but history and other activities. And it does need clarifying what those principles are. And if Dennett had that in mind, then I agree with him. Having got that one clear, then the issue is what do those principles show? Mm. And if they show that there are scientific laws and previously existing universe, the question is whether those principles suggest that we ought to look for a further explanation of these things. We're keen to jump into your thought on that in, in just a moment's time. But for now, I was interested in knowing what it is that got you into philosophy in the first place. A lot of GCSE students and A-level students and undergraduates will come across your work in philosophy of religion courses or religious studies courses, and you might motivate them to get interested in it and pursue a career in it. What was it that got you interested? Well, I'm interested in the deepest questions for their own sake. But also, I have always been a religious person. I've always believed that there is a God and certain further truths about him. And I am interested in knowing whether my beliefs are true. And if they are true, whether I can give other people reason for believing that they are true. And these two considerations motivate me. Issues are interesting in themselves, 
and useful, crucial, in fact, for showing people how they should live in this world. I wonder then if there's been an intellectual, maybe a hero or somebody who's inspired you on your way. So previous guests have said they're intellectual heroes. Pat Churchland said Francis Crick. Susan Blackmore said William James and Darwin. And our most recent guest, William Lane Craig, said his intellectual hero was Alvin Plantinga. Has there been anyone like this who's influenced your own thinking, Richard? I'm afraid not, really. I've picked up my ideas from different places, and certainly people I I know know a bit too for various things, for different theories that have been put forward about the nature of scientific explanation and the principles that operate there. And I was, in particular, became interested in the probability calculus as a way of formalizing these principles. And I worked my way through Carnap's logical foundations of probability at an early stage. But as regards arguments for the existence of God, I was much inspired by the medieval scholastic tradition. I didn't think I was started off by that, but uh, as I was beginning to work my way towards such theories, I was glad to find that kind of endeavor I was doing was that of Aquinas and Scotus. I read much of one of the Summa Theologiae uh, in my mid-twenties, and that was, that was another inspiration. But ideas come from various places in my background. So apart from Karnat and the medieval scholastic tradition, it's hashtag no heroes from Richard Swinburne. <laughs> well, I did say other people in the philosophy of science who put forward theories about the nature of scientific explanation, such as Hempel. Another classic question we'd like to ask our guests, Richard, is whether they've changed their minds on any significant philosophical position throughout their lives. Some examples from our previous guests Eugen Nagasawa told us he was converted to theism from atheism through the ontological argument. Rutger Bregman, the other way around, from theism to atheism via the work of Bertrand Russell. And Sam Coleman, from agnosticism to pantheism. Have there been any big shifts like this in your own thinking? No. And I wonder about this because, you know, I admire people who have a view and then they're open to arguments and they see these arguments and they change their view. It shows that they mind about truth and they are influenced by it, at least. (laughs) They may have other motives for being atheists or for being religious. There are bad motives for being both. But it looks as if that is a significant motive, and that is admirable. Now, I wonder each time I go through my arguments, and I think they're correct, I wonder if it's really because I don't like changing my mind about things. And all I can say is uh, I don't think it is, but there you go. Of course, I, I mean, I've deepened my views I have on, on many matters. Mm. When I was first religious, I had no idea about the nature of scientific explanation or public arts or anything like that. And I've certainly changed my views about um, what you said, not so much minor, but Somewhat uh, more than minor matters, but as regards the central framework, no. Part one Is there a God? So, we've been doing lots of episodes on alternative concepts of God lately. So, Richard, To avoid confusion, could you say what you mean by the term God? Well, I mean what the Christian tradition has meant throughout its life. The Christian tradition has meant different parts of the tradition have been a lot more specific than I'm going to be at the moment. It has meant that there is an omnipotent personal being who created the universe, not necessarily at the beginning, he might have sustained it in existence forever, but he's responsible for its existence at every moment of time. He is omniscient in the sense that he knows everything logically possible to know. And I should have said his omnipotence is an ability to do everything that's logically possible to do. He is perfectly good in that he always does the best when there is a best. And otherwise, always, when there isn't a best, always a good action. And he's perfectly free within that constraint to do anything. That is what I mean by there being a God. So how do we interpret some of the classical problems or paradoxes with these attributes that you've mentioned, like things like omnipotence and omniscience? 
So just a couple of common examples that are used, you know, can God create a rock so heavy that he himself can't lift it? Does God have the power to sin? Knowing what I'll freely do tomorrow, is the concept of God a coherent one? Well, it needs to be spelt out rather carefully to deal with those points. As for the rock, the normal Christian view, and perhaps I should have said that at the start, is that he has the properties which I have mentioned essentially. That is to say, Mm. uh, they belong to his nature. An essential property is one that if a thing has it, then it wouldn't exist without it. Mm -hmm. It's an essential property of my desk that it occupies space. If it ceased to occupy space, it would cease to exist. Now, God's properties, the ones I mentioned, that is, apart from being creator of the universe, which is a contingent property of God, the other ones I've mentioned are essential properties of God. That is to say, that's his nature. He can't get rid of them. Uh, And there will always be Whatever being you has, has essential properties, and he will always maintain them as long as he exists. So the answer is no, God cannot create a rock that is too heavy for him to lift. And it is logically impossible to do so, because to bring that about Mm -hmm. would be to bring about God existing without one of his essential properties, and that is not logically possible. The next one you mentioned was... Does he have the power to sin? Well, if by sin you mean do what is morally wrong, the answer is no. And why not? Because it's one of his essential properties that he is perfectly good and always does the best when there is a best and otherwise a good action. Mm. So no, that is not possible. He will often uh, do less than the best when there isn't a best. Very often there isn't a best, but he will not, could not sin, no. And finally, does he know what I'll freely do tomorrow? In my view, no. But that is a much contested matter in the tradition. When I said he's omniscient, I explained it means that he knows all that's logically possible to know. Mm. I do not think that it's logically possible for anybody to know what a future free agent will do. That means understanding free in the sense of someone is free if it's up to them what they do, despite all the causes which influence them. There are some views of what freedom amounts to which aren't like that. But given that, what I will do tomorrow is up to me at that time. Mm -hmm. So if God had a previous view about that, it's up to me. (laughs) I have it in my power to make that view false. Now, God being omniscient, it can't have any false views, and therefore it's not logically possible for him to know what I will do. Uh, This does presuppose that God is in time, a temporal being, that is to say there's a history to God. He does this at this time and that at that time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't change his essential properties, of course, but he contingently creates the world possibly at a time, does certain things in it. Not all the tradition, but quite a bit of the tradition has held that God is outside time, and therefore this sort of argument won't apply to him. But I can't give any sense to the notion of an agent outside time making a difference to things in time. But even if one could, then it seems to me a very understanding of God being outside time would mean that he knew at every moment in his life what. I would do tomorrow. But if what I would do tomorrow is up to me tomorrow, I can't see how there can be any being who, except after I've done it, would know what I would do. So I can't give any sense to that. But many people have striven to do that. Even if they succeed, I don't think it would produce a very attractive picture of God. I like to think that we interact with God. I do this. He's angry. I say sorry. He says that's all right. These are successive events. One is a response to the other. But if it's all worked out in advance, as it were, timelessly, I'm not interacting with him. Mm. And therefore, it's not a picture that I would welcome. But the main reason why people have adopted it is they thought that would be a more perfect being if he was like that. I think it would be a less perfect being. I'm just curious, Richard. So you 
gave no pretty much to all of those examples. Do you find these paradoxes a very useful part of the philosophy of religion? Are we getting more to the core of what God is? Or are they distracting nuisances that kind of don't really understand the point of the Christian God? They spur us on to be a bit more, more precise about what omnipotence is or what omniscience is. And um, no, no, they're very helpful. Moving on to the existence of God then, rather than just the concept of God. The atheist, like the theist, seeks a complete explanation of the universe. The existence of the universe, the atheist might say, is a brute fact. And we're exceptionally lucky that the laws of nature, the cards, have fallen as they have. Now, Richard, your case for God's existence rests on probability. So to put the question simply, why should we think the theist's explanation of the universe and its existence and its fine-tuning is more likely, more probable, more appealing than the atheist's complete explanation? Because it's a great deal simpler. We always look in science and elsewhere for not merely an explanation that if it's true, that would lead you to expect the evidence, which you wouldn't expect otherwise. But there will always be an infinite number of explanations which could satisfy that demand. And it's only the simplest one that is most likely to be true. Now, the scientist picture of the universe is it consists of an enormous number of atoms, possibly infinite, but certainly beyond human counting. And It might have had a beginning, but it's governed by laws of nature. Now, it depends how you understand what is a law of nature, and that's a rather important question in the philosophy of science. What is a law of nature? But I think the fairly obvious way to understand it is laws of nature are simply statements about the powers and liabilities of objects. That's to say that the law of gravity operates throughout the universe is to say every atom in the universe attracts each other atom with such and such forces. And therefore, this is a property of each of the atoms. So interpreting the scientists, atheist scientists, my ultimate explanation is there are infinite or innumerable number of areas of atoms which have exactly the same properties as each other, and that's a brute fact. Mm. Now, that's not a simple starting point. Why? It's an enormous coincidence, as it were. And even if you have a somewhat different understanding of laws of nature as sort of outside the atoms and governing them, some people do, the question then arises as to why there are innumerable atoms which are in fact governed and why the same laws hold in every part at every time. And once again, you multiply. But the theist explanation is that God is not a physical object and therefore doesn't Mm -hmm. consist of bits. And he is a simple object who can explain the multitude of things. How would you respond to the atheist who says, let's say I'm a materialist and yes, I do believe that these laws of nature hold everywhere in the universe. And I just say it's a brute fact that they operate on the same laws no matter where. And then they say in response to you, Richard, your quote unquote simple explanation assumes the existence of this whole other type of substance, the supernatural entity. And that's not simple at all. My simple, in my parsimony basket, I've just got material things, but you've got gods and maybe even souls and and the things that come with the supernatural world. How would you respond to someone that says, no, the materialist view is simpler? Well, science is all the time postulating some rather strange entities, hitherto unknown and not available in medium observable sizes, in order to explain the behavior of objects that are observable and of medium size. It postulated atoms, which nobody could see at the time, in order to explain why certain substances combined in certain ratios by weight and volume to make other substances. And then it said, why are there all these elements, elementary things? And it said, well, because there are protons and photons and um, so on. Mm. It began to think be the case that these things have some rather strange properties. They are both, in a sense, particles and, in another sense, waves. And this is pretty strange. But so long as it gives the right results and it's fairly simple, then that's reason for believing it to be true. So the same would apply here. However, I would make the other point that I don't think that immaterial substances and the God is the only immaterial substance. 
we cannot explain the nature of persons without mm. supposing that they consist of two parts, one a body and one an immaterial soul. So we've got a model, as it were. And the way the soul operates on the body parallels the way God operates on the universe. I'm sure we'll return to souls in, in a moment. When we spoke to astrophysicist Katie Mack, Richard, she told us that the universe is very unstable, that the second law of thermodynamics or entropy states that all order will turn to disorder. Does this count as evidence against your view, do you think? Uh, sorry, can you make that a little more precise? The second law of thermodynamics states that entropy always increases, and you can understand that as the world becomes more similar, as it were, at different parts. It seems to be expressing it as a point about chaos, could you uh, make it a little more precise just for what the objection is? Sure. So assuming that we're talking about God creating a universe, for example, that humans can exist within, surely the second law of thermodynamics would create a state of a universe where human beings wouldn't be able to exist within that universe. Does that help make it more specific? Well, I, I don't see why, if God created the universe, why would humans not be able to exist in it? Is this the one from Heat Death in Katie Mack's book? She says the eschatological view of the universe will someday come to an end and that shows we're just in the sweet spot and we're just hanging on. Yeah, well, that might be true, but is that a reason why God hasn't created the universe? I mean, that human society has to last forever doesn't seem uh, something that God would necessarily be committed to in virtue of his perfect goodness. He might, in virtue of his perfect goodness, keep each of us alive forever, mm. but it wouldn't be in this universe. And that uh, raises other questions, but to suppose this universe has always got to go on with people like this in it seems, uh, don't see why God should make it that way. So the objection is, you say the universe is fine-tuned for existence, and someone like Katie Matt might say, it might seem that way, but you're just lucky to exist in this particular part in which things are organized and they seem ordered, but don't worry, it will all be over soon. And you say, so what? Like I go and see a play or go to a football match and it's all organized there and the show's on, but then everyone goes home at some point at the end of the day. So it, uh, my view doesn't involve the stability of the universe indefinitely. Uh, thank you for the example. <laughs> <laughs> Let us pause for a moment to say a quick thank you to all of our divine patrons for making the show possible. In particular, a very special thank you to the man with the greatest conceivable fashion sense. It's Mr. Adam Cool. He pities the fool who denies the existence of God. It's Mr. T. He's not the Messiah. He's a very naughty boy. It's the life of Brian Ramirez. As eternal as God's love, it's Miss Lily Hooper. Sweeter than God's love, it's Andrew Cherry, man. If you want eternal salvation, vote Pedro. It's God's best friend. It's Saint David Leginess. He loves God, but not as much as slightly grey cheese. It's John Breeden. If the sheep are on God's right, then this boy's on his left. It's John Goat. TA. Turning water into wine and wine into a good time. It's Stefan Lornberg. The man who loves all of his neighbours unconditionally. It's Michael Kisley. Breathing life into the cosmos. It's Jamie Lung. The unmoved mover, that is Jay Wheelless. And last but not least, the man whose name is harder to understand than the Trinity itself, it's Maron van der Kolk. If you're enjoying the show and you want to follow God's commandments, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into the discussion. You also are arguing, Richard, that the traditional Christian monotheistic God is, is simple or, or simpler than, for example, polytheism or pantheism or panentheism, for example. Can you explain to our listeners how traditional monotheism is simpler than these alternatives? Well, the way I would do it now, I used to say that it's simple in that it postulates a person who has only three properties, the property of omnipotence, omniscience, and perfect freedom. Uh, mm. It has these eternally, and that's right. But I think I can get the three properties all out of one now, and oh, wow. that is out of omnipotence. Mm. Every sort of personal being has to have power. God has unlimited power, and that is a very simple degree. 
of power because it's zero limits to it. Mm -hmm. A being will only be truly omnipotent if he knows what the consequences of his actions are. So he will have to know everything knowable because consequences can always be described in terms of what has happened earlier. That is to say, God can't now bring about a second world war because there's already been one. And nor can he bring about a fourth world war because there hasn't been a third one. And so everything that's happened in the past entails a certain description about the future. And so he can't know what will be the effects of his actions unless he knows what the world has been like. Mm. He won't know whether they're good or bad unless he knows their moral qualities and the necessary truths that apply to them. So his omniscience follows from his omnipotence. Now, he won't be omnipotent if, as it were, he's subject to irrational forces in any way. So if he sees that some action is good to do Mm -hmm. and is the best action to do, inevitably he would do it because to recognize an action as good is to have some motivation for doing it. You can't say this is a very good thing to do unless you have some motivation to do it because we humans are subject to irrational desires and therefore uh, don't always do the best, but God is not subject in virtue of his omnipotence to irrational desires, and therefore he always will do the best. So his perfect goodness and his omniscience follow from his omnipotence. And of course, he won't be truly omnipotent unless he's perfectly free to do anything that's logically possible. And so that follows too, so that begins to follow doesn't follow, of course, that he will create a universe, but since there's a universe, and if there's an omnipotent being, then it must have come into existence only because he created it or he allowed someone else to. So it all follows from one hypothesis, and that is very simple, the postulation of a very simple kind of being who always exists. That's fascinating. There's absolutely loads of questions I'd love to ask you about that. It's clearly more simple than polytheism, which would have more than one of these gods. We might not be able to deduce their other attributes from one attribute being omnipotence. But what about something like pantheism, the view that God is a universe and the universe is God? We've seen this new wave of interest in philosophy of religion of people saying maybe God is this big conscious mind that is able to fine tune the universe because he's identical with the universe. Could they do something similar? Let's have a look at each of these in detail. I think they, they need got significant problems to them. Pantheism, in its traditional form, says that the world is, consists of innumerable atoms, each of which are proto-conscious. Mm. Well, even if that's true, it doesn't affect uh, the greater simplicity of them having one cause. If it's the suggestion that the God is the identical with the physical universe, in any normal understanding of the physical universe, that's simply not true. The physical universe has many different parts to it. And I am postulating a God who is, doesn't have any parts to him. Therefore, it must be simpler. Just one more question on the nature of God. When we spoke to William Lane Craig, he said that one of the weaknesses of your view is that you don't think that God exists in every possible world, whereas Craig said he does think that God exists in every possible world. Could you clarify, do you think God's a contingent being? Does God exist in every possible world, on your view? It depends what you mean by possible world and what you mean by contingent. Now, possible worlds are a philosopher's invention. I mean, to say that something exists in a possible world is simply to say, it's logically possible that it exists, or what mm. it used to be. There's, there's now a thought that it means it's metaphysically possible for it to be. And I think I'm going not to explain metaphysical possibility at the moment, just for the sake that it takes, uh, unless you press me, it takes quite a long time to do that. But let's just mm. say logically possible, which in my view is what's at stake. Well, it looks as if to say God exists not in every possible world suggests there's a sort of region of it of the world where he doesn't exist. Mm. It doesn't mean that. It simply means that it's not a truth of logic that he exists. And what is it to be a truth of logic? Well, in my view, something is a logical 
truth, if and only if the negation of it entails a contradiction, not just to say, right. there is a God would be a truth of logic, if there is no God would entail some sort of contradiction. And then, so all of this boils down to, there are English sentences which do not entail the non-existence of God. And I don't think that's a very profound limitation on God. So that's where I leave it. Um, sure, God isn't. So it's logically contingent, meaning by that, simply what I've just said, mm. logically contingent, there is a God. But it may nevertheless be necessary that there is a God in some other and deeper sense, and I think it is. That is not a deep sense. It might be, and I have speculated about this, that the answer is that God is the cause of himself. Mm -hmm. It's not very easy to get you know, in a normal sense of cause. That doesn't quite work. But talk about God is bound at some stage to be analogical. And so if we stretch the sense of cause a bit, that might be the answer. But on the other hand, in the end, the only reason why anything is, is because God makes it the case. So it must, in the end, something like that must be right. But the fact I can't spell it out is simply a human limitation. In any talk about God and his nature, we have to come to some things we're not going to know. I think only God can know why there's a God. Mm. But that casts absolutely no doubt about arguments for the existence of God. Mm -hmm. I can argue for the existence of certain particles, and the argument will be very good, even if I can't explain what made the particles. Another thing to bear in mind is if it were a truth of logic, if, for example, an ontological argument works, if it followed from God is the greatest possible being and it's greater to exist than not exist, then it rather looks as if we're giving an explanation of why there is a God in terms of something deeper. Right. And if that were the case, then God wouldn't be as great as if there isn't that explanation. You're saying like an ontological argument gives the reason for why God exists and then it's not quite as... Those who put that forward deny that it does. Yeah. Well, that's why I say that it looks as if it does. It certainly looks to me because, after all, one is then saying, well, is it, if it were the case that it, was, uh, it wasn't better to exist than not exist, then there wouldn't be a God. So, as it were, there's a reason why there is a God which is deeper than God. I'm just saying that ontological arguments don't, in fact, work. And I do think that God is a logically contingent being, but I don't think that cuts it any way to his detriment because, in the end, all it means is that there is an English sentence, there is no God, which doesn't entail a contradiction. So at the end of our first installment, Richard, we have a quick quiz, which is Mystery Philosopher. The Mystery Philosopher. So you're going to hear a quote from a philosopher, and you and Ollie, you've got to try and guess who the philosopher is. So I'll give you some hints if you need them. In religious belief, as elsewhere, we must take our chances, recognizing that we could be wrong, dreadfully wrong. There are no guarantees. The religious life is a venture. Foolish and liberating error is a permanent possibility. If we can be wrong, however, we can also be right. <laughs> Any guesses on that? It's a contemporary philosopher, if that helps anybody. I was going to say William James, so now I got that completely wrong. <laughs> I'd have written it myself, but I don't think I did. <laughs> no, I'm not going to be that sneaky and put one of your own quotes in front of you. Uh, born in Michigan, if that helps anybody. 88 years old. That's, that's well, Alvin was it Plantinger. Alvin Plantinger? That's Alvin Plantinger. Well done to you both at the same time there. <laughs> Join us next week. We'll be discussing religious experience and substance dualism, as well as the problem of evil with Richard Swinburne. It's already available on Patreon. So go over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast or hit the link in the iTunes description. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Psychast. 
The next installment of this episode will be available a week on Sunday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the next installment of the show. To support the podcast and get yourself heaps of extra perks, head over to www.patreon.com forward slash pansycast or hit the link in the iTunes description. To find out more about the show and get all of our old episodes completely free, you can visit thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That was great. That was really good. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. (laughs) That was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. (laughs)